Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card for uh, Saturday, July 9th. It was originally a 12 fight card, which was reduced to 11, which was juiced back up again to 12. And if you knew the hoops and obstacles and hindrances I had to overcome to be able to do this video, um, you will know that this is a very blessed video, and everybody that watches this should really win $100,000, okay? Now, everybody can't win $100,000, but all the, difficult, difficult, all the different technical difficulties, travel issues that I had to endure to get this out to you guys, this is either, you know, totally blessed or a colossal train wreck. And as you know, with DFS and in life, there is often quite a fine line between something that is blessed and a colossal train wreck. Nonetheless, I was able to think about and plot out this card for several days now. And I think I have an idea of what the best approach is. We're just going to use the DraftKings, um, the DraftKings slate here to screen share. And we're not going to use the best fight odds. I'm just going to tell you which fights are the are those that have the most finishing upside, which fighters I think have the most grappling upside, and the way I would approach this slate. Um, first of all, kind of right off the bat, I do want to say that there are two fights that I think are not worth doing at all. Um, well, I shouldn't say not doing it all, but let's talk about Shevchenko Chase uh, Casey, uh, the two women's fights, and also Cavillo against Nunez. I think neither of them have a particularly good finishing upside. Um, they're inside the distance props are both, both very poor, and I tend to avoid them. I do, however, have this really weird mad scientist idea that Shevchenko is a good play. Um, I just can't imagine anybody in their right mind playing her at 8,700. And she does have some take takedowns, okay? Um, she has them somewhere, okay? Um, she has two takedowns, so a couple of years ago, she's got one takedown, whatever. And from what I've heard, she does at least go for some takedowns. So, um, I'm not going to make her a core player or anything, but I'm, I'm definitely going to sprinkle her in. But, but in general, those two women fights are a no-no for me. Um, let's talk about some of the key fights on the slate. So one key fight on the slate is the Ronnie Lawrence against Takramano fight. And it is the, a classic, well, not exactly classic. I was going to say a classic win condition type situation because Ronnie Lawrence... If you just even game log watch, I mean, he had six takedowns and eight takedowns in his last two fights, leading its way to 130 fantasy points and 135 fantasy points. And that is what you call ceiling and a really good score. However, <laughs> um, Kakramanov is not bad um, from what I've been able to gather. And from what I also heard, he has some takedowns of his own. And what that leads me to believe is that he probably has some good takedown defense also. So you're talking about Ronnie Lawrence, who is probably going to be the most popular, well, at least one of the most popular fighters on this card, given all of his, I mean, just look at this, this game law. How, how, can you not, how can you not take this, right? Especially at only 8,400. But He's going to be extremely popular. And if Kakramanov is a, is, is a good enough grappler to just good enough to negate Lawrence's takedown attempts and things like that, Ronnie Lawrence might bust. And I'll tell you something else. You know, Ronnie Lawrence is only a small favorite here. I think Kakramanov is very, very live to win. And, and in a fight card, which is kind of bereft of really strong underdogs, I think Kakramanov is very, very live. Here. So, while Lawrence is going to pop as an extremely strong play, and in cash, I think it's a good idea. In GPPs at extremely high ownership, I would just be careful about going too crazy with this spot. I mean, I've just been around the block, and when you see a game log like this, who's not going to play this, right? And if that's the case, why is he not three to one, a three to one favorite? Because his opponent's really, really good. So, um, the other thing about Ronnie Lawrence is it's only recently that he became this kind of chain wrestler. So 
I feel as though it's not a pure win condition situation. I think he could win without getting a million takedowns. Um, so don't be surprised if 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 you get a, a Ronnie Lawrence decision win and it busts. All right, that's possible too. So you know it, it's a nice, easy fight to kind of think about, but it in in practice and execution, I wouldn't go so crazy on the Ronnie Lawrence side. Um Okay, uh, Kenny and Ju- uh, uh, Kenny and Juku versus Carl Roberson. This fight, unfortunately, is one you're going to have to deal with because of the 8,200 8K price tag. I personally don't think it's going to score all that well. Um, I think it's going to be a really boring fight, and the odds see- and the you know inside the distance props seem to support that. But at these at these prices, you're just going to have to get these in your lineup. Um, I'm not going to prioritize it, but if you land on these two fighters, you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just moving up the card here. You have Onama at 9,300 over Armfield. So this is the, this is the fight that kind of replaced the, uh, one that was lost. Onama was supposed to fight somebody else and Armfield came in as a really late replacement, like a, you know, five days of, of prep time. And he's an eight to one underdog and Onama's priced at 9,300. Okay. Um, the thing is, is there's a couple of things going. Number one, 9,300 is tough. Okay. And his inside the distance prop is fine, but it's not as if he's like a lock to finish him in the first round. And I will tell you to say this at 9,300, if you don't finish your opponent in the first round and you don't have an incredible amount of takedown upside, 9,300 is just going to bust. Okay. Um, so I don't know how, you know, how much I'm going to trample over people to play Onama at 9,300. Um, these guys actually fought as amateurs um, like several years ago. And what's his name? And Onama won a decision. I mean, I don't know. Who, who's to say? <laughs> Onama is so great. You know, uh, I actually am going to have a little sprinkle of the arm feet just in case, right? Because you just don't know. You just don't know. All we're going with is on the betting line here, which certainly makes sense, but Armfield supposedly has a lot of power. And listen, he lost to Onama, and since their careers have taken different paths, I guess, Onama probably isn't th- thinking about this, you know, his fight with Armfield at all. But I bet you Armfield, watching Onama kind of move up the ranks, saying, oh my God, I could have beaten this guy. Maybe he could, maybe he couldn't have. But I think he is going to be really relishing for this opportunity more than Onama is. So, I don't know. I think I think I think Armfield might have a motivation edge. I don't know what that means, how much that's going to translate to, but I'm definitely sprinkling this. Uh, Gore Brundage, another fight that you probably should deal with just because of the price and because Brundage is in and out of a lot of finishes. He's a pure wrestler, but when he gets on, sometimes he misses his takedowns and he gets guillotined and he gets beat up, and it's kind of crazy. Um, and Trevin Gore, he's got KO upside, but he's not, you know, that season. So we got what I like to do in a fight like this is just take both sides. You know, I am going to be playing multiple lineups, and I will take both sides of this. Uh, Shevchenko Casey, we talked about. Tercio Sahabi. So I go back and forth on this one, right? So Tercios is a guy who does, it does, he does not have a really strong finishing prop. He doesn't really have that many takedowns, but he puts up so much volume that and he just does so much that you just have to consider him but as i've watched the ownership kind of grow over the week i think he's going to be a fade for me Um, i'm going to be under on him in mme and i am going to be not going to play him in the single entry okay because the fact is he's not your typical guy with that all that upside right and i will tell you this i mean i was watching that he stand fight and he stand he he hung in there and he stand i think was was either a late replacement or somebody nobody knew about or something like that and you know uh he was game so i don't know how much i want to go on tertios here as as possible chalk but uh listen that's just my view of this mularkey against johnson so Johnson at 7,100, it's interesting because, you know, he does get KOs in his finish, in his wins um, some of the time. He's got a couple of KOs, a couple of decisions, but 
he just has his reputation for just always doing the wrong thing in the ring. Um, the problem with Malarkey, he does go for takedowns. He's very, very active. But man, I'm just not used to him at this price. You know, he, he was a really live underdog against Worthy at 7,600. He was a really live underdog against Smith, for Devontae Smith at 7,500. Even at 8K, he was a pretty live 8K guy. I mean, it turns out he got, he got, he got KO'd, but you know, I wouldn't, I didn't mind playing him then, but all of a sudden you get guys like this that are now 9,100. I mean, the guy's got to do a lot at 9,100 to pay this off. With that said, I think he's live here and I think I might do it. Like, I think I'd rather go for the malarkey than the tercios. Um, that's just my opinion on that. And Johnson is going to show up as like a 7,100 punt in, in, in some people's content or whatever. I'm, 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 just, I'm not doing it. Okay. He's 37 years old. He has a reputation for always doing the wrong thing. And if you get rid of the sticker shock of Malarkey being a 9K, you'll see him. He is a big, big time. He's like a two to one favorite. He is younger. And I'm just, I'm not, not going to play the Johnson side. Uh, Nunez Calvillo, we talked about. Vandera Sherman. Your, your low-level heavyweight fight, okay, which is going to have two fat guys that look like they have no skill are going to just stand there and try to bang each other to death. And, and the fight probably isn't going to last more than a round and a half, and you're going to have to have the winner. Um, that's my opinion on this fight. Vandera has multiple paths to victory. Apparently, if he decides to take down Sherman, it's over. However, he never takes anybody down. So just because we want him to take Sher uh, Sherman down, these guys are not the brightest and, and their training camps are not the brightest either. You know, so, so they might just all oh, just stand in the middle and just, just slug away. And if that's the case, give me both sides, you know, and, you know, and, and these fights, look, they can be really boring three round decisions in which case they bust. But in general, I've just seen these fights score more often than not. Even last week, that Pado fight two weeks ago, it was look, it ready to be the most boring fight ever. And it went from one guy getting KO'd in the first round to the other guy getting KO'd in the second round. And the guy getting KO'd even in the second round gave up 120 fantasy points. So these fights you just have to play. Uh Nurmaga Medoff versus De Silva D'Andrage. Um, so this was actually kind of a surprise to some people when Nurmaga Medoff just went out and subbed uh Stamen. Um at 8,600, he scored 118 fantasy points. That was coming off, I think, like, looks like a year and a half layoff or whatever it is. And then the last time he fought was in 2020, uh, 122 fantasy points. I just think that he's a fade. Uh, that's the best, the best I could describe it. I mean, why all of a sudden, just because of the one result, now people are going to say, oh, obviously he's got finishing upside. Um, for me, I'm inclined more to go with this with this dude. Okay, the like Silva Dandrade. I mean, sub TKO gets in a three round scrap. You know, I think this guy is very very live here, and at the very least, I think he can give Nurmaga Madoff some trouble. And so for me, I prefer other guys to the 9200 uh, Nurmaga Madoff. I would prefer, if anybody, to take the Silva here. Um, at 7k and just hope he gets a ko um but i'm probably more inclined to fade the fight but for me i will definitely have more andrade than your maga medoff um probably fade the fight though this is my thing, my my horse all right uh barala he was 7800 okay and he looked like he looked like he was 10k i, mean, I don't know he only had 77 fantasy points here the reason why is that he did have 10 minutes of control time, but he didn't really do all that much when he was on top. Okay. And this is what's kind of difficult about this spot is that he's 8,900 and people are, are betting him for all the takedown upside. And he has it in part because Petrosian has incredibly poor takedown defense. Right. So this is the problem with trying to fade a guy like Barala is when both fighters kind of are conducive to the same results, right? 
Pedrosian, I don't. I guess he doesn't mind getting take down, taken down from time to time, in the hope that the guy gasses himself out so he can come back later. But it's going to be tough to keep Baralho from getting these takedowns. So at eighty nine hundred, I think I kind of like him. I, I like him alongside of Malarkey. I think both those guys are very strong plays. Um, a hell of a lot stronger than the main event, like like Fiziev. I just don't like this at all. Um, He's a pure striker, number one. Um, it's not re- he's not really even a volume striker. He just doesn't put up a lot of fantasy points. So when you have this five-round fight and you have Dos Anjos, who has five-round experience, I mean, you got one, two, four of his last five fights were five rounds. And in his last one, he had five takeouts, putting up 10 million fantasy points. And the, the fight before that, he five rounds, he put six takedowns, put up 5 million fantasy points. He had four takedowns here. I mean, dude, this is this is a serious DraftKings play, right? Because he's like a two to one underdog, so he's going to win the fight thirty three percent of the time. And when he does, he's going to score huge. Like I, I might even say that he could get in the optimal even if he loses, just because of his style and, and the way DraftKings scores. That if he just uh, survive, does he have superior striking? and get in there and get some takedowns, I think he can even survive a, a loss. You know, nobody. one thing I've noticed in the research is Fiziev has not been tested as far as his takedown defense yet. So, I mean, let's go. I mean, 7,200, I would, I can't tell you how much, how much more comfortable I feel with this than with say, I don't know, Michael Johnson or something like that. Um, I, I just think this is a, a really elite play. The only thing that's, that's, that's preventing from being a super elite play is the ownership because everybody's got to play this, right? Um, but I don't know. It wouldn't be the first time people didn't do what I thought. In his last fight, he was literally a theoretical lock at 7,300 because he was fighting a replacement fighter and he was basically a two and a half to one favorite over a replacement fighter and he was still priced at 7,300 and he had five rounds to work with and he had the takedown upside and he should have been 80% owned. And he was like 40. So who knows? But I will listen. I hit the optimal last time with this dude. I'm going to go right back to this. And he's going, I'm going to be live to him in probably all my lives. Um, if not all of them, a certain quote unquote shitload of them. And that should do it. Um, and that's really my key to the card, honestly, is I'm going to play Dos Anjos. If he loses, I mean, I'm not even going to say I'm going to lose because I could I could get there in a loss. I say that if he loses, maybe I'll only have 20% of my lineups live. And in those, they're going to be really, really kooky. Um, so uh, hopefully this kind of late slate analysis has kind of helped you here. And uh, good luck in this weekend's card.